We are going to have a technical session on sustainable urbanization and other environmental issues. It's my pleasure to invite Professor Sucha Singh Gill to chair the session. Professor Gill served as Professor and at the Department of Economics, Punjab University, Patiala. He is currently the Vice President of the Indian Association of Social Science Research Institutions and the Elected President for Annual Conference for Indian Society of Labor Economics. I would like to request Sir to conduct the session now and to introduce his speaker. Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, it's my pleasure to be here and uh, I hope that uh, in spite of uh, a post-lunch session, uh, uh, panelists will uh, take the decision and uh, keep all of you awake. And, uh, we are late by uh, 50 minutes uh, in the queue. And, uh, we have four speakers, and uh, I request them to each of them to take uh, 10 minutes uh, for presentation, and uh, then we can have uh, some time for it. Also, I welcome all of you in this uh, technical session, and uh, taking much of the time, the issue of sustainable urbanization and other environment issues, uh, they are very important. Uh, I will. Uh, start directly by inviting the first speaker, uh, Dr. Ritesh Kumar, uh, who is a Conservation Program Manager, Wetland International, South Asia, New Delhi, to start with uh, his presentation on wetlands and smart cities. Inculcate some discussion and some thinking on uh, the role of wetlands, the blue spaces within grey landscapes. And uh, Chennai is very fresh in our memories, so this is enough time to do so. Uh, yes, urbanization is increasing, and I need not uh, bother that again with this August audience. And smart cities are seen as pathways for better urbanization. And amongst the principles that are being talked about, a small phrase that has been inserted by the ministry is called sustainable development. But within the sustainable develop within the onion of sustainable development, several issues are embedded, one of which is wetlands. Now, wetlands are places where land and water meet. They are as lakes in Bangalore. You could have large wetlands, uh, you know, floodplain lakes, East Calcutta wetlands in Calcutta. So they are embedded in the landscape in multiple ways. How have we been treating them within urban spaces? So typically, if the lake is very beautiful, you can use them as amenities. And this is uh, uh, Lake uh, Velaini uh, near Trivandrum. And you can put up a hoarding, charge money, and enjoy the fees that comes from the access. But if the wetland is not well taken care of, you can end up in a situation like this, which is poor Bandar city, dump all the muck, dump all the solid waste, dump all the garbage into the wetland, because there is no claimant, no NGO, no EIA ever done on, on, a, on a wetland system. But the impacts are not just within urban spaces. The impacts can be very far away. I take you to Manipur, northeast, to Manager urbanization in Imphal city, a beautiful wetland, Loktak Lake was dammed. Uh, we lost the habitat of the deer, the vegetation cropped in, uh, the fish was lost at the cost of gaining hydropower for urban settlements. The restoration cost was 400 crores and we are still after 15 years debating whether it is partial or total restoration. So there is an implication within the urban boundary and there is an implication in the wider landscape. But is that all? Mind you not. because. Wetlands are the places where you draw your fresh water from. Mind you, this water comes in a water bottle, but for sure it was derived from a wetland in some form. Cities like New Delhi, Bhopal and Kollam depend critically on wetlands for their water supply. This is the famous Bhoj wetland of Bhopal. City of Calcutta treated its waste in the wetlands. The whole muck of Calcutta city goes into a series of sewage fed ponds generating nearly 30% of the fish which Calcutta city eats, lot of vegetables and urban employment. And by the time water goes out of the wetland, it is also treated. So nature service free of cost. Much of the rivers that feed our South Asia region, 10 of the largest rivers in Asia, rise high up in the wetlands, high altitude wetlands of the Himalayas. They are feeding two fifths of global population. But imagine the condition of floods if Wetlands as Deepar Bill did not exist, Guwahati would have been devastated year after year, even if the magnitude that you get is highly moderated by Beals as Deepar. 
but they are also integral to our culture. North India Chak is one of the examples where people, water, wetlands all come together within three days frame. But they are also an economy. So Kerala, one million people visiting, and I'm told the contribution wetland tourism makes to Kerala's economy is nearly six to seven percent of the state's uh, domestic product. And they are critical for beautiful things as water birds. So all your wetlands would have beautiful birds coming in from Central Asian Flyway, and you enjoy them, have your recreation organized around them. What are we doing to our wetlands? As, as per our conservative estimate, we have lost nearly 30% of our wetlands in the last three decades alone. The numbers would be much higher if much more sophisticated imageries were used for assessment. What does that mean for urban spaces? I won't go back to Chennai, but take you to Kashmir. Now, you, you know these photographs, but look at the basin. The basin, the Kashmir Valley, is a depression sitting uh, amongst the hills. The Jhelum River flows, flows all through the city and then opens into a large wetland called Buller Lake, once claimed to be the largest freshwater wetland in Asia. Throughout pre-independence, post-independence, wetlands were always seen as areas to be drained and reclaimed, and that was what was done. This is the photograph of Buller Lake. In 1911, more than 230-odd square kilometers. This is the photograph in 2007. 70% of the wetlands were reclaimed. So where does the flood water go? It sits into your houses. And today, after the Kashmir deluge, when the government is reconsidering urbanization, reconsidering disaster risk reduction, wetlands are still missing from the landscape. I need not speak about this slide, but Pallikarnai Marsh has reduced by 90% in five decades alone. Yes, you have issues with the reservoir, leading a lot of water into the city. But if you lose your buffers within urban landscapes, you are bound to get into situations like Chennai time and again. Today's Times of India newspaper, Delhi edition, talks about similar situations in Delhi, Bangalore, and all cities. So we are sitting on a time bomb. So this was not social exclusion. This is environmental exclusion that is being done by mm -hmm. planners. So numbers are amazing. I collated evidence from all parts of the country. This is a very small diaspora of evidences. The numbers would range from anywhere 50 to 60% of wetlands within urban spaces are being lost. What do we do? Now, I'm not an urban planner, so I can't, I can't speak on the side of the urban planners, but we do have a very well-evolved philosophy of how to manage wetlands, and we call them as wise use. These are not touch-me-not systems. You can use these wetlands to achieve sustainable urban outcomes on the principles of wise use, which is about maintaining its functions and biodiversity at the same time. There are principles. Now, India is a signatory to Ramsar Convention. And in 2012 Conference of Contracting Parties, some principles were adopted in which wetlands and urban spaces could be linked together in planning, in programming, and in investment. I won't labor on the principles, but these are available and accessible to all. Now, what are the challenges? Now, automatically, this would not happen in a day. We can keep on raising these issues with the policy makers, with the governance, with intellectual forums like this. But there are challenges. As wetland practitioners, we have been so much amused in looking at the wetlands from inside. So what is the beauty inside wetlands? What is the water quality? What is the water bird? What is the fish? What is the productivity? Mm -hmm. If we were to integrate wetlands into urban, we need a new kind of science which brings about how can floods be managed by putting wetlands in the landscape. To take you into a map in China, different wetlands in the huge basin have been mapped and what kind of functional integrity can be achieved by managing wetlands both within urban areas and outside urban areas. This is this, a, an assessment done in Oxford. So if upstream wetlands are lost in Oxford, this is the kind of floods that you get. If they are maintained, this is the kinds of flood reduction we get. Now this is the kind of science that we as wetland managers need to generate for urban planners to use wetlands as infrastructure within urban planning. But we also need to look at governance. Now it's not only just that urban governance is failing in general. <coughs> Even the framework of wetland governance is not well developed in the country. The formal systems, this is Chilika Development Authority, a very famous restoration example. The chief minister, Mr. Naveen Patnaik, heads this authority. All secretaries sit there. And it's a very nice structure wherein government, bureaucrats, NGOs, stakeholders can sit in, take decisions about their wetland. But there are informal systems. 
You can informally connect to wetland authorities, and these kind of soft and hard institutional arrangements need to be looked at. But formally, the core question is, is the country willing to accept wetlands as a land use category in their own right? If you don't account for wetlands, you are bound to miss them in all planning process. So if you account for agriculture, forests, rivers, wetlands are missing. And finally, it is about integrated planning. Wetland conservation is not a conservation planning on its own right. It is a linked problem, linked with all sectors, but it is also linked in terms of financing. So as the government coffers on conservation are drying, if the central government is saying that you know, state governments now take to you know, increase financing from their own budgets to the uh, wetland conservation challenges, new models of private sector participation and international funding will need to be looked at. So I'll close here, Chairman, by saying that wetlands are but integral components of solutions in smart cities. Unfortunately, the references are yet to be made. Wetland wise use principle needs to be embedded in the way urban planning and policy making is being done. And that can be only done when we rec uh, recognize wetlands not just from their amenity value, but also from their functional roles. And finally, it would need better information base and governance solutions. Thank you, Chair. I hope I've maintained my time. Yeah. Thank you, Ritesh. Uh, you have uh, stuck to the time frame and uh, made your point uh, of the importance of wetlands uh, uh, and its role in planning maintenance in the smart cities. May I now ask uh, Dr. Tanuka to make a presentation? <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, my presentation is uh, about something quite different, uh, not about environment in that sense of the term. Uh, it is ab about rural-urban linkage. And uh, I'm speaking in the context of demographic dividend in India. I'm going to rush through the first few slides because uh, there is a time problem. So basically, um, we all know that there is a lot of talk about demographic dividend and you know, dependency ratio, that is the proportion of old and uh, plus young to the working age population is going to go down in the coming years and so on. So India, if it has to, uh, as you know, India has a very high uh, percentage of um, uh, rural population, but the GDP is so much does not come from there and a lot of unemployment and underemployment. So essentially, we have to absorb this surplus labor. And one way of doing that is through the uh, urbanization, you know, urban rural linkage, where urban centers can exert pull factor for the surrounding rural areas. So basically, what we did was uh, in this ICSSR funded study, we looked at two uh, towns in Bihar. Yeah. We looked at two towns in Bihar to see whether, uh, to what extent that was present and how, what were the sources of urban growth. So I'll go back to the first slide to show these, which are the two towns. These are Bihar Sharif and Madhubani, uh, where uh, Bihar Sharif is a much bigger town and Madhubani is a much smaller one. And as you can see, Bihar Sharif is much more urbanized than Madhubani. Overall, Bihar itself is very lowly urbanized compared to overall India. It's only, India is about 31% urbanization and Bihar is just about 11%. And uh, uh, only Bihar Sharif has some presence of manufacturing if that is going by the overall economic census data, which I'm not going into at present. I'll be just talking about the survey results and survey findings. So we got this uh, list of the registered shops and establishment and we took a stratified random sampling by industrial classification. And uh, then we surveyed overall 251 enterprises, 139 in Bihar Sharif and 112 in Madhubani. First of all, what we found was that um, generally there's been an industrial decline. Like Bihar Sharif, uh, in the last uh, 20, 30 years, uh, in Nalanda district, uh, which is Bihar Sharif is present in Nalanda district, uh, coal storage units, thread and paper making units, biri making factory, shoe factory, I mean, so many key informants told us of how many factories have been closing down. Madhubani is also highly agriculture based. It has less number of factories, it had, but even those have closed down. In fact, all the key informants said that at present, Madhubani practically has no industry. Now, what is the distribution of the surveyed enterprises by type of activity? 
As you can see, manufacturing is about 18%, uh, so which is quite low. Trade is maximum, and then other services. Service and trade is very small. It's just about six units. This is by type of enterprise. This own account enterprise is uh, the enterprises which do not uh, employ any hired labor on a regular basis. So that is very that is a very high share in Madhubani. Total enterprises out of those, 50 percent is uh, own account enterprises, but there is no hired labor employed on a regular basis. And the others are non-directory and directory enterprises, depending on the number of hired labor. I'm not going into the definitions here. Then what are the types of enterprises? This is just to give you an idea of the kind of enterprises that there are in the two towns. Bihar Sharif had sawmills, cold storage units, hotels, restaurants, etc. Madhubani did not have any of these mills, but it had hotels and restaurants and cinema hall and so on. Non-directory enterprises, there are all kinds of uh, stores. And own account enterprises, there are uh, shops selling cloth, grocery store, small flour, flour mill, etc. Now, uh, see the distribution of surveyed enterprises by the number of workers. As you can see, nearly 83% of the enterprises surveyed, they are accounted for, they, have, they are employing only one to five workers. And if you would see the more than um, uh, 10 or more, it is just 7.6%. So that gives you a glimpse of the type of enterprises that exist in these two towns. Now, in r then we looked at the rural urban linkages. One is by the share of enterprises which hire workers from rural areas. So out of, as I've already told you, 37 or 38% are OAs, which are own account enterprises. So they don't employ any hired labor. So among the rest, about 55% hire workers from rural areas. Among these types of units, manufacturing is the maximum. Like 72% of the manufacturing enterprises uh, hire workers from rural areas. But if we look at the number of hired workers, then we find that uh, in manufacturing units, 90% of the uh, workers are coming from, hired from rural areas. As you can see in this table, um, the total um, number of uh, hired adult workers is 610 here. And uh, if you look at the manufacturing uh, enterprises, it is 90% is hired from the rural areas. Even the other services and service and, uh, tra trading is also quite high, 60-61%, but manufacturing is exceptionally high. So what are the kind of uh, rural-urban linkages that we see? Uh, one is uh, obviously, you know, uh, the manufacturing units like flour mill, oil mill, they are all sourcing the inputs locally from the agricultural hinterland. And directly they procure raw material from farmers. In fact, with cold storage, I will just go into it that there's a link with even outside uh, North Indian states otherwise also that I'll show you in the next slide. Mostly the enterprises sell the final products locally. Mostly very uh, locally, some <coughs> within district, but basically not very far away, not to the uh, far away urban uh, areas. And rural customers also come to town to buy various items, so that linkage is there and to access various services. And some of the uh, town people, like ice cream vendor, or utensil seller, et cetera, they go to sell products in rural areas. And there are, of course, the linkage by worker who are just selling their own labor, like rickshaw pullers or masons who come in from the rural areas to town to work. I'll just take a minute on the cold storage units we found that there has been a steady decline in the number of cold storage units in the area, which used to employ a large number of people. The closure has been mainly due to power problems and their alleged competition from neighboring states like West Bengal, uh, Odisha, and so on, and lack of modern chilling technology. They also face setting up, uh, somebody was talking about land prices in the morning, saying that all the all places have had high land costs. In fact, Bihar Sharif has the same problem. It, is, uh, it has relative proximity to Patna, and the land cost is extremely high. So the, now the uh, startup price for starting a cold storage mill 
is very high. So people sometimes prefer to rent out the place, rent out the land or sell the land like that. Then banks are also reluctant to lend because many of the people have been unable to repay their loans. So what they're now doing, many of the cold storage unit owners, they're getting fruits from Ludhiana, from, from generally from Punjab, from Himachal, and they're storing fruits to utilize their idle capacity. Most serving units have been contracting in the last five years. Now, further to the linkage, from how far do the rural workers come? We also had some data in the survey on that. So average distance traveled daily is around, uh, you know, for nearly 50% is four to six kilometer. But for uh, even 22% is even more to seven to nine kilometers. And nearly ha um, around half spend around rupees 16 to 20 daily to reach workplace. And mostly they are hired through social network, family friend network. Now, in order to see what is the perception of growth in the towns, we asked uh, a question to the uh, enterprises who have been operating for the last five years that how, yeah, okay, I'm just finishing. How have you, uh, how do you, how have you been um, uh, looking at your operations? Have they been expanding, contracting, or stagnating? So we find that most of the trading units have reported expansion, but it is the manufacturing units which <coughs> reported maximum contraction as well as stagnation. So we conclude here that uh, the sample towns witnessed industrial decline, as we have seen. Both are uh, <coughs> characterized by small size enterprises and largely informal. I haven't discussed the informality feature in this slide. Trade is the main driver of urban growth in both towns. And we are here, we were, our main focus was to see how we can transfer the surplus rural labor to the, uh, in the more productive urban sector. But we have seen that like Madhubani has a very high share of OAE in enterprises. So that uh, implies a very limited scope for absorption of rural labor. And rural urban linkage, ironically, is highest for manufacturing activities, both in terms of labor and input output linkage. But it is the manufacturing enterprises which have suffered most contraction and stagnation. Thank you. Thank you, Tanaka, for uh, bringing in the issue of uh